Uh, welcome to another exciting edition of the School Safety Free Period. I'm Amanda Klinger. And I'm Dr. Amy Klinger. And we are with the Educators School Safety Network. We are a national nonprofit organization and we typically are very academic and we're very serious and we do a lot of research and we provide resources and we do professional development. But during our School Safety Free Period, we're a little bit less serious. Or a little more informal. A little more It's a better way to say it. Yeah. Um, but we do still talk about school safety concerns. Um, we tend to focus a little bit on what's happening in the news when it comes to school safety. And then we always have some important discussion and important takeaways. So, yes. But it is a little bit more informal. We have dogs banging around here. It is a live stream. Um, and we encourage folks to um, join us and, uh, we, and join in. Okay. Sorry. So we have a little bit of potluck today, um, but stay with us because it will all join together like a beautifully threaded beads in a necklace that will all come together. <laughs> just just stay with us. So, so I want to talk about a couple of things that, that maybe do not seem related, but they kind of are. Okay. So the first one was um, something that I ran across where they were having some conversations um, in Florida with the Florida legislature mm -hmm. about the whole issue of their anonymous tip line. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things, I think it's called Fortify Florida, um, that that is come out in the in the wake of the tragedy um, at Parkland. And clearly there is a time and a place um, for an anonymous tip line. And clearly we are big advocates for disclosure and having kids tell us what they know. Mm -hmm. Um, but we also have been spending a lot of time recently sort of examining, and I think it's a very relevant examination, we've been examining sort of the unintended consequences of some of this stuff. Yeah. Like, oh, we do this thing because we think it really makes sense. Mm -hmm. And wait, maybe there's some unintended consequences. So one of the things um, that was the, the point of this conversation, and this was the gentleman who is... Um, the president of the State Superintendents Association in Florida. Yep. And he was talking about because of the anonymity with the app, which we can understand to mm -hmm. a certain extent, mm -hmm. um, there's been a lot of issues of calls coming in very regularly with lots of vague details that then go out to law, for law enforcement officials and to school officials and they have to respond with this high degree of seriousness, mm -hmm. regardless of what that is. Um, and he gave an example um, of one of the tips that came in and it said, someone was holding a gun looking object. I don't know who it was. And that, that was a tip? That was the tip that came in. Stuff. At, right, and it predicated 15 deputies and three different school district SROs or officers who spent four hours searching in this school before determining that the threat wasn't even real. And so it really illustrates, you know, and we know that, you know, if you, anytime a kid has an opportunity to do something anonymous, it's going to be, you know, you suck, ha, 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 you know, like prank calling almost. Mm -hmm. But yet we also have to acknowledge this is such an incredibly serious sort of situation. And so now, you know, we've kind of, uh, the school administrators and law enforcement are finding themselves in, okay, what do you do with that threat? I mean, there's there's one concern I have right off the bat, which is when we as institutions, when we as the state or when we as schools set up a tip line and we have like this, this is a formalized system where we want you to report to us, that's great. But that does create a legal duty yeah. for us to then address, you know, the, the tips that people send to us. So that's kind of the, the first difficult unintended consequence. I mean, is that, yeah. that I think, I know I've, I've read stuff where they are just concerned about the sheer workload that they yeah. have created for well, themselves they had one, in all of these they tips. Had, they had five fake tips just one morning in September. Yeah. Um, and that was just in one district. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, imagine the, yeah. the workload. But on the other hand, do we want to say, hey, everyone calm down on the tips? Right. I mean, we can't. Well, we talked in the, we talked in the last webinar about in our research how we were seeing that the the weaponization of false reports or mock attacks um, is really people weaponizing the fear of school shootings. And you you have to keep in mind where we are in this process. I mean, when we first started doing this work in 2010, we were trying to get people to take the threat of a school shooting seriously. Yeah. And so now we're at the point where that that pendulum has sort of swung to the other end. What, think of where we are in the process of asking students to, to tell us things that they know. I mean, it wasn't too long ago that the only 
uh, message that students were getting from the school was stop tattling, right? I mean, right. it hasn't been that long that we've been asking students to tell us the things that they know. So there's there's going to be some growing pains. I mean, yeah. we're at the beginning of this process of of asking students to to tell us tips, asking students students to tell us concerns, and and I think you know as part of part of that to keep in mind, it's going to improve with work. It's going to improve. But we need to make sure that we're also asking for information, not just about a shooting. And I know that maybe that's what's being covered more in the media. And that's, a, and that's and a lot probably of the false, a lot of the false tips. Yeah, are, that's probably are about what's that. coming into the tip line. I, but I'm just saying, as we continue to have discussions with students about, we need you to tell us the concerns that you have. If you have a friend that you're concerned about, you can tell us, and we're going to help them. We need to make sure that we, in part of that messaging, it's not just see something, say something, see something about a gun. No, no, no. See something that concerns you about your yeah. classmate, about your friend, about someone who's in danger, about someone who's um, making you know really wild decisions. If you see lots of different things, say something. We need to be really intentional about that. Well, I think probably the best thing that came out of that article was the whole discussion about trying to make it similar to Crime Stoppers, where mm. it is you have anonymity, but there still is the ability right. for officials to reach out to that tipster. And I think <clears throat> that is probably the best way to sort of refine the system because we do need to follow up with folks and we do need to be able to know who that was, yeah. but yet there does need to be this anonymity. So in that same vein, then we go on to another school in Florida. We're not picking on Florida today, but... I can see the picture, so... Yeah, really like this, floor, this school in Florida <coughs> had some a concerned family member call the school mm -hmm. to report that a student had brought a bong to class. Unfortunately, uh, the school employee thought they said a bomb to class. So they evacuated the school for the bomb. So, I mean, <laughs> there, I'm going to not make a joke. I'm just going to not. There's a lot that we could say. But um, I think, and actually, it also happened last year in a school in Massachusetts as well. So, tip of the day careful listening. Excuse me, was that a bong or a bomb? So there is some articulation about... and careful listening. <laughs> are you concerned about an explosion or are you concerned about the drug use of your child? What, which is it? But, it, and, and, I, and I hesitate to come down on this because then it makes people go, I'm not going to divulge stuff because I don't want people making fun of me. Mm -hmm. But at least we did something about yeah. that. So at yeah. least we had a person that called and at least we had a person that took it seriously and a person that enacted a response. Mm -hmm. So as much as it sounds like we're making fun of them because it is kind of funny, we're not because it's really indicative of the fact that they got beyond the bias of, oh, that can't mean what they think right. and took what they heard and acted upon it in an appropriate way. So there you go. Yeah. I mean, I also, I thought that teens were only vaping. I didn't know that we even... I don't know. That's out of my wheelhouse. Although I do have to laugh. I'll, I'll have to read you the, the line from the, the article, though. Um, it prompted an emergency evacuation. Fortunately for all involved, nothing went up in smoke, which is, it is kind of witty journalism. Yeah. I mean, the old English teacher in me. Yeah. So so then, so we take this, sticking with this whole theme of false reports and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Um, it, well, and I want to say, I want to say one thing. Yeah. We, we joke about that and I'm thrilled that no one was injured, that there wasn't a bomb, that it was just maybe a, a poor choice regarding cannabis use. That's true. And, and at the end of this event, that's where we can end up and say, okay, there was no threat. There wasn't a bomb. It was a misunderstanding. That's wonderful. But as we always say with these, there's a cost because, yeah, yeah this was an error because of an elaborate, you know, miss what I misheard or a game of telephone or whatever the case may be. But there was a time where people thought there was a bomb in that school and they yeah. responded. And those kids, for a time, thought there was a bomb in that school. And so we cannot, you know, we, we chuckle and I'm glad that no one was hurt and there was no danger. But we, we cannot forget that when all of these things that are just threats, there is the, the response that's needed. Mm -hmm. There's the loss of instructional time. There's all these things that we always talk about. There is a psychological cost to kids because yeah. there is a period of time in that response where people really thought there was a bomb. Yeah. And we, we can't lose sight of that. All right. So now in <clears> keeping <throat> with my carefully crafted potluck. No, well, theme. yes, potluck. theme. So the next bead on the chain um, is oh, talking right. about, this is talking about a, an article that was in Newsweek this week 
about um, the whole idea of the, and again, this is Florida one more time. Sorry, Florida, one more, one more quick one. Um, about the decision to arm teachers that it will lead to more dead children and all these different discussions. And that's not what, what struck me about this article because I think it raised some really valid points that need to be talked about. And clearly we could do a whole episode just on that whole idea of arming of teachers. Arming teachers. Yeah. But they make, um, the, the author makes the assertion um, that arming teachers is the wrong way to solve, and I'm reading directly from the article, arming teachers is the wrong way to solve the almost daily occurrence of mass shootings. And that's what I want to talk about. So when you dig a little de deeper into this, it's going back to an article from 2017, so two years ago, mm -hmm. um, looking at rates of mass shootings everywhere right. in all different walks of life in all different places and mm -hmm. all different so it's broadly defining <clears throat> someone is shooting at someone with a gun right and but either deliberately you, or inadvertently yeah. applying that metric and saying there is a daily shooting is a daily occurrence right. in a if school you, if you read that quickly it is again perpetuating the idea that exactly. shootings happen every day yeah. exactly yeah. so if we're talking about on this hand, we're talking about this whole idea of why do we believe these false reports and why does everyone overreact when they hear these things? Because I don't know we if it's have been I don't know if no, it's but fair to that's what someone that. would say. Yeah. Someone would say, "Well, why would you send 15 deputies just because, because someone said a gun-looking object?" Because you have to. Yeah. Because we number have to. one, yeah. but also number two, because we have inadvertently created a narrative that says. Of course it's a shooting, yeah. because of course they happen all the time, and of course it's a daily event. Mm -hmm. And so that really led me to a separate article where they were talking about the stress on officers as well. So you have these back-to-back -back false shooting reports, and this was in Wisconsin, and it was talking about how they're sending everything they have they're throwing everything they have at the response mm -hmm. to this you know this was the message that just said something about it was an active shooter and they weren't sure and so everyone's heading in and then that brings a whole bunch of other points of that they were raising of so when i come into this response whether i'm law enforcement or i'm whoever i am mm -hmm. with the assumption that there's an active shooter which i have to because mm -hmm. that's the way it was reported right how much more does that create two problems? Number one, the situation of I'm responding to an event that's not really there, mm -hmm. and I may f see something or somebody yeah. is holding something yeah. or someone's acting in a way, and they have no idea that I'm responding thinking that it really is an active shooter. Right. And so it really illustrates the danger of... Yeah. Well, okay, it was just a threat. Well, okay, he, he thought he saw a gun. Or, oh, okay, well, the kid was messing around somebody is going to is going to get hurt. There's going yep. to be a really dangerous, if there hasn't already happened, there's going to be these really dangerous situations. So you have that. I'm surprised when we talk about the, the mock attacks. I know in our research we talked about this this uptick in mock attacks. The, the part about that surprise that surprises me most is that someone hasn't been injured yeah. while doing yeah. a mock attack yeah. and someone is responding as and, and this real. is this is from one of the police um, <clears throat> spokesmen. Now we're responding in an active shooter type mode. We're going over there, lights and sirens, as fast as we can. Mm. We're getting there. We're going to don ballistic helmets, ballistic vests. We're getting out our AR-15s and our squads, and we're going to approach it as a tactical situation. Mm -hmm. There is the potential for a lot to go wrong. Mm -hmm in that particular yeah. situation. Yeah. So there's certainly that. Then there's the stress on officers of mm -hmm. and the adrenaline of the people in the building mm -hmm. that are being told in this particular announcement, it was get out, get out active shooter, get out of the school, it's not a drill. Because somebody had reported to them there was an active shooter. So they enacted a level three yeah. active shooter response as well they should. Mm -hmm. Because who's gonna be the principal that goes, let me yeah, wait probably and see. Not. I didn't hear anything, right. let me wait and see. Yeah. But then there's also that third thing that, that worries me that I haven't seen a lot of discussion about, and that's the user fatigue mm -hmm. of how many times are we going to do this? Boy, when they cry wolf. wolf. Yeah. How many times are we going <clears> to <throat> do this to the point where I'm like, you know what? It's probably not. And that's where we are with bomb threats. Yeah. Are we going to get there with shooting threats? Yeah. Is is kind of the question. So, so I thought that was really, you know, that really illustrates, again, We've seen this trend. It's happening. 
there is a tendency to minimize it and go, well, it's better to be safe than sorry. So maybe we should worry a lot about school shootings because we're better off to be safe. I'm not sure we're safer because we have an exaggerated worry about it. Well, I, the worry, certainly, and the, the concern that I always have and that I always talk about is that people are willing to undertake whatever it takes. That, that, that reason, uh, evidence-based practices, the things that we typically are the, are the guardrails of the decisions that we make in education, those guardrails are thrown out the window because people are willing to do whatever it takes yeah. to, to respond to the, the problem of school shooting, which is why you have people talking about arming teachers. Which, which is I guess face. you could argue and go, yeah, we should do whatever it takes. If we could prove it were. We should do but what if we're we doing do, whatever it takes and it's should, actually making how about it worse? We do whatever makes sense. I mean, yeah. I mean that's the it's not it's not I mean it, it, it and some of this is, you know, there, but there's no guarantee of, that whatever it takes <clears throat> it even works. Right. I mean, and that's what we don't have a ton of evidence. When we're talking about response, when we talk about violence prevention, we have a lot of evidence based solutions and unfortunately the the emphasis is not as often on prevention as it is on response. Um, but I mean, you, you talk about, you know, user fatigue and are we any safer? This conversation is going to shift very rapidly when someone is injured in a response. Yeah. When a, a response that, and, oh, I'm not, and I'm not saying it's well, over. that's probably already happened. It's going to yeah, shift when really there's hurt. a high profile version of that. Right. And, 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 you know, not an over, and I'm not saying, I don't want to use the word overreaction, but a reaction that after the fact turns out was unnecessary. Because I don't, I don't want to put blame on these people and say, oh, you're being hysterical, you're overreacting. You have to. I mean, we have created the culture. Yeah, and we, we have... read it later and go, wow, <clears throat> come on, how'd you not know that? In the heat of the moment? Yeah. Pff, yeah. And who, I, I want who my can... kids' school to overreact right. and, and as opposed parent, to stand yeah, around right. and wait to prove it. What educator and what law enforcement person can go, well, are you sure it was a gun? I mean, no one, you can't do that. And so people are in an incredibly difficult position. And as I say, with all of these, all of this, all of this discussion that we just had, there is a intangible, in, like, difficult to measure cost to students and educators yeah. to have this to continue to happen yeah. Yeah. and to be, to be hanging over people. I mean, there's a cost. All right, so now we're going to switch from picking on Florida, which was not really intentionally picking on Florida. It's just sometimes there's a lot happening in Florida. So, uh, And now we're going to switch to our other group that I'm sure sometimes feels targeted, and that's our bus drivers. Well, there is a lot happening with bus drivers. We talked buses. about the, yeah. you know, and again, and I, I was looking uh, at an old podcast of ours from a year or two ago, and I said that, and I'll say it again. I could no more drive a bus every day than the man in the moon, so I get it. But Wait, you couldn't drive a bus and you couldn't be a man in the I moon? I mean, like, every day. the man in the moon couldn't drive a bus. No, I mean, like, I could no more be that than <laughs> I could be the man in the moon. You know what? I don't really know how that saying goes yeah are you sure that's even an idiom it is an idiot it's just not, i didn't say it right but it is it's not right. i could no more drive a bus than i could do other Anything. things not very well either no like a podcast i could no more drive a bus than do an effective podcast is that a better way to say it i don't know i think the podcasts are incredibly in fact okay well so i don't know what you're whatever about. it is my point is i don't want to drive a bus that, that's my, I'm saying that's my point. I'm not capable of driving the bus. Well, that's what I might be I'm, capable of driving, but I don't want to do it. So yeah. having said that, it seems kind of crappy that we're going to go after bus drivers. But we have got to have some hard conversations about bus mm -hmm. safety and mm -hmm. bus drivers and so on. And this was illustrated again for us in North Carolina, which I believe was the last one, when we had our drunk driver, bus driver, and the driver I don't think we talked about on the filming, podcast. I don't remember if we did that one. I don't one, think we did. I think where that was the, at a training. The kids were screaming as the drunk, as the bus driver is drunk driving the bus. Uh, that was just two weeks ago. So that's not like, oh, in the distant past. Um, so this one was in North Carolina again. And this is where a school bus ran over a child, a 12-year-old, who got off the bus. Three kids got off the bus. Two of them crossed in front. He did not because the door closed on his backpack. And so as he's trying to extra, you know, get his backpack, extricate his backpack from the door, the other two people walk in front of the bus and the driver says, oh, we must be ready to go and goes and ends up running over him. Luckily it was his arm um, that, he, that he was, you know, he was not seriously injured, but geez, it just, you know, and there's two things about that. Number one, I think sometimes, you know, and this is, 
was my second thought not my first thought but my second thought was you know in the movies we always see you know the action guy is dragged a thousand feet and then just dust himself off and he's cool or he jumps onto the hood of the car and he drags it you know we we think and we see in cartoons or whatever and we that's a real serious problem yeah your, your backpack in the door of that bus and the bus rolling over your arm. That's a big deal. That's not a oops. So was he, he was dragged by the, dragged yeah. by his backpack and then ran over, got run over? Uh, yeah, he was dragged Jeez. about 10 feet before he finally was able to break <clears> through <throat> from his bag. But when he got rid of the bag, he fell and the bus, um, the back tire ran over him. Jeez. So, yeah. So I How mean, old of a kid? 12. And so, again, it's an accident. We understand that. Right. But... We have to take seriously what's happening on school buses. Mm -hmm. Who's driving them, what's happening, how kids are, you know, and, and we used to have these discussions that said, you know, the school bus is the safest thing your kids can do. It's safer than you taking your kids to school. And it probably still is. But that doesn't mean that it's immune from criticism or immune from potential accidents, accidents and other sorts of things that happen. And it just seems like we've seen that uptick. Yeah. And I think we really, I, I think schools need to be challenged a little bit to kind of look critically at, like, what are we doing? Are we okay. just assuming that everything is good or are we really monitoring? Are we looking at it and, and not waiting until we have a kid that's run over? Yeah. Well, and, I, and this is not really related to a, a bus accident, but I, I think, you know, in, in this situation, in some of the ones where they're, you know, the bus driver is letting the kids drive the bus or the bus driver's drunk, there's a very clear, like, blame to be had. Here, I mean, this sounds like this was an accident. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a good reminder for us when we're talking about school safety. There's a lot happening in schools that are pure accidents. Right. When you but, kid, when, but if three kids <clears throat> get off and only two kids walk in front of the bus, it is an accident, but somebody was not paying attention. Right. And that's the in-between, between just ridiculously being ridiculously negligent right. and a pure accident that no one could have stopped. It's that gray area in the right. middle that really gets well, us. And, and I guess what I was what I was going to say was, you know, when you have, we always talk about you have 300 kids in the lobby before school officially starts, and we don't really have supervision there. That's not ridiculously negligent, awful, and it's not a pure accident if a kid falls. Right, because, because we're you not knew there were 300 kids yeah. coming, and yeah. you had one person. Yeah, so I, I think we yep. to extrapolate that. I mean, we have some pretty graphic examples from, from the area and the world of buses, but that happens on playgrounds. That yep. happens in lunchrooms. That happens in a lot of occasions in the general uh, operation of a school where we are kind of taking for granted that it, yeah. everything will probably be okay. And that's what bothers me about <clears throat> some of these situations is you can look at these ridiculous ones and go, well, clearly I would never, we would never have a bus driver let the kids drive, which is probably what that district said too. But okay, we would never have a bus driver do that. Great. But would you have a situation where you have people that aren't quite trained enough or and, there's not and quite enough people. And some of or that, we are very and some of that much, is a function of pure yeah. complacency. Yeah. And I think it's that gray area that I get concerned about. Where I know there's 250 kids or 300 mm -hmm. kids in the lobby. Mm -hmm. And I've got three people, but only one consistently shows up. And well... Right. Right. Just because it's not flagrant enough to immediately get you arrested <laughs> doesn't mean that it's not a terrible idea. Mm -hmm. And doesn't mean that there's not eventually going to be consequences. And this particular uh, driver was charged yeah. with reckless operation. So, I, I mean, yeah. so yeah. And so that takes us. I was because we're about out of time. So it I think takes you us got to our final last, one. Our last one way here. Get a survey, final right? one. Yep. Final one <clears throat> is uh, let's say what this one is not. Oftentimes we teach by saying this is what something is and this is what something is not. This is not in any way, and, and you're welcome in advance, this is not an invitation or a discussion of politics. You're welcome. Um, the reason that, probably because the two of us could not necessarily have the same views on any political issue, I think. But uh, I was struck today by the conversations that have erupted with teachers unions mm -hmm. um, coming out and endorsing impeachment, the impeachment inquiry and the impeachment stuff. So here's what I want to say about that. Um, it has nothing to do with your political view of it. It has to do with, I want to raise some questions. I'm not even going to give opinions. I'm going to raise questions to our listeners. 
my questions to the listeners are, is that what you wanted a union for? So if a union is advocating for its members, is your union advocating for its members? And are there issues happening in schools that are not being advocated for because our union leadership is, is, has chosen to advocate for political concerns as opposed to the, what's at the heart of the membership? So that's, I guess, kind of the, the question that, regardless of where you stand on the issue, well, is that they, the function? Uh, because one of my concerns is... I read is, this. Do they say, like, why we're weighing in on this? Uh, no. I mean, yes, I'm sure that they do. There's some sort of formal statement, et cetera, et cetera. Hmm. But I just think it's interesting The AFT and uh, the NEA mm-hmm. have, have come out with these statements about that, which, great, okay, have statements. But my question to to union members is, is that serving what you pay dues for? Um, are there issues that are not being addressed in education? And what I want to tie this to is where I think you want to go to, is the increasing conversations we've had with people, both media reports, but also in our work and in practice in the trenches with teachers. We are hearing so many discussions about violent, aggressive behavior on the part of students and on the part of parents. And teachers being victimized, teachers being afraid, teachers being unable to deal with it, teacher, you know, instruction being impacted, and all these really negative consequences associated with violent, aggressive behavior, which we saw in our own research that we Mm -hmm. talked about in Mm -hmm. the first webinar. And I just think it's interesting, why is that not something that, uh, that representatives of teachers could concern themselves with? Well, I, I think my concern, I mean, I, I think <clears throat> maybe the unions are going to come back and say, you know, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can be concerned about two things at once. I think my my bigger concern is, you know, we're in immersed in this work of school safety, and you tend to hear the same folks talking about stuff, coming out with mm-hmm. stuff, doing research, professional development. You set, tend to hear people who are, have a sustained presence in this realm. And that's and it's not the unions. Not been the unions. And it's not been the unions. And, and, and we, we started talking about this in 2008 yeah. when we were saying, "This is a personal safety issue for your membership." Mm-hmm. If if we mm-hmm. were a I don't know a coal mine or a uh, metal manufacturing plant, and all of our people were getting their arms chopped off, wouldn't the union be interested? Yeah. Well, and and not just to and the, and the union like has come out and and you know called for this and called for this and you know and they've come out and said you know obviously it's unacceptable for teachers to die in schools because of violence so it's not that they've they're completely silent on this issue but i am surprised that you don't see more of a presence of the union having a sustained commitment to this to advocacy and, and more importantly that the, the solution for our school violence problems needs to be an education solution yeah. it's just been sort of like there needs to be a solution to this as opposed to the solution to this needs to be educators, and it needs to be driven by educators, needs to be informed by educational practice, it needs to be part of our professional development. Right. It, it, there, it, I mean, and because, that, I think, is what's most surprising. Because the, inten- the intention of <clears throat> unions, having been in a union for a long time, the intention of unions is to give you a seat at the table, mm-hmm. right? right? We don't have a seat at the table very much in the school safety conversation. Right. Why, are, why is that not a, an issue worth fighting for or ver, ver, worth advocating for. And so that's kind of the, that sort of reflection. And then that leads us to the other part of what we, we'd kind of like to hear from you folks as our, as our listeners is, do you see that trend of violent and aggressive behavior? Or is that sort of a self-perpetuating theory that we're, we've we, heard about it and now we're listening for it more? It's sort of like you buy a car and then you see that car everywhere you drive. Is that what that is, or are you guys experiencing? We've seen a number of major metropolitan school districts that have had some really significant issues with that and not really been able to make a lot of headway. So I'd be yeah. curious to see. Yeah, so there's a link in the description um, of this video to just a quick couple question survey because we'd love to hear you know your take, if that's something that is a concern, if that's something that you know, is maybe overblown and isn't that big of a concern, but we'd love to to hear you weigh in on that. Yeah, what is the scope of the problem and how equipped are we to deal with it? So uh, that's the end of our our live stream for today. We're really thrilled for the folks that were able to join us live. Hi, hi. Um, For those of you who are joining us as a podcast, 
Um, if someone sent this to you, you can subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. So Apple Podcasts, iTunes, that's the same thing, Apple iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher. Um, you can listen to the episodes directly on our website. Um, there are lots of other videos. If you're finding us on YouTube, we have tons of other videos on YouTube. We have other webinars. Uh, we have a webinar next Thursday. Coming up Coming. next Thursday. <laughs> <clears throat> the hypocrisy of school safety. Ooh. It sounds tempting already. Oh, I know. It's like it, cl- clickbait. It'll, it'll be awesome. Yeah. Um, and all of those professional... Gather your friends. That's a good professional development opportunity. Yeah. Um, and all of the professional development that we talked about, the podcast, the live stream, the webinars, that's all available for free. Um, if you're looking for any other resources, we talked about our research into school-based violent incidents and threats. All of that is available on our website, which is www.eschoolsafety.org. And we hope to see you next time. So that's it. Okay.